everyone, welcome. Um, this is Science Fiction Subcreation. Uh, welcome. Uh, good to see you all, uh, some of you for the first time, and uh, some of you old friends. Uh, this course is a fancy way of looking at the works of Lewis and Tolkien. Uh, together, I did C.S. Lewis last semester. Some of you were with me. Uh, not all of you. Last class was not a requirement for this one, but it will continue on uh, what we were talking about uh, last time, uh, at least parts of it. But it's going to push it more in the direction of science fiction, at least as far as Lewis goes. Uh, and that's what we'll be looking at. Last time I looked at Narnia, and I looked at uh, The Great Divorce, and I looked at uh, Till We Have Faces. Uh, but I, it was a general course in, in Lewis's thought, so we looked at his uh, literary criticism as well as his some of his apologetics, although my colleague, uh, Dr. Davis, uh, that's his course. So I, I dealt with the stuff he didn't do, uh, by and large. And um, whereas this is more focused, and um, the title is a little bit odd, and the combination of Lewis and Tolkien is is sort of odd, but insofar as normally when you do what I'm going to do here, which is look at Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you, do, you would do it alongside Narnia, right? But I did Narnia last class, and I'm not doing it here. Um, and the reason you would do those together is because they would be the fantasy, right? And you would normally see the two as authors relating to fantasy literature, uh, if you want to call it that. And, um, but I had a different purpose here, and the purpose that unites them is not just that they're friends uh, and, and colleagues, so they worked at Oxford U University for over 30 years and met weekly in a pub in a group called the Inklings, which you may or may not know. Um, and Tolkien was instrumental in his friend C.S. Lewis coming to faith, uh, which is a story you probably know already. Uh, but they also had a uh, shared experience outside of Oxford in the trenches of World War I. And I think that experience colored their lives, uh, not just because of the friends they lost there and the fact that they were your age when they were in the trenches, uh, but also that the, the uh, hostilities of World War I carried forward into the Second World War, and to some degree, probably continued after that well, in the Cold War between the communist uh, bloc uh, dominated by the Soviet Union and, and the West. And so there was this uh, conflict, uh, totalitarian conflict that dominated the whole 20th century that's really the backdrop for their work. And there is a theme that unites that too, or a common concern there, and it is addressed in different ways. And one of them is through fantasy, the other is through questions about the whole way in which science fiction operates. And so I'm going to look at it from the two sides. As I say, we could. I, I last semester looked at Narnia as Lewis's response in fiction to the problems that he identifies in his literary criticism and in his essays and his apologetics and so forth, the crisis of modernity. But there's one particular problem there which is posed by the problem of technology, which I think is a common theme in both man's work because I think the Lord of the Rings, the ring is a symbol for technology, which is a symbol for magic. It's a certain type of magic, a certain domination of all life that comes through technology which it marks their age. And they see it as dehumanizing and they see it as against, uh, against the natural order of things, against the moral order of things, and against the idea that uh, the universe is created by God, for God, uh, for his glory. Uh, that is in both works, uh, both men's works. But you can come at it from different angles, and they do come at it from different angles here on this course. So the course is going to begin, it's obvious, like these things I don't need to put up, this is not a first year class, but the course description sort of represents what I just said. It focuses on their response, the problem of alienation, uh, which is not just their problem, it's continued to our day. 
uh, and technology furthers the alienation. Uh, last class, I, I taught first year, just before this, two hours before, and I talked about how uh, everyone's, this is no bolt from the blue here, nothing particularly uh, novel about this, everybody's glued to their smartphones. A means of technology, they're a lot like what Tolkien describes as the palantir, the seeing stones. You can see in one side, somebody who has the palantir, there are seven of them on the other side can see that person as well. Well, that's like your smartphone. You can see somebody at great distance. It's a form of magic, but it's a magic through a technology, and technology is not neutral. It has a certain effect on people. Tolkien depicts that very strongly in his Lord of the Rings. Obviously, through the Palantir, because remember, Sauron has one of them, and he is able to capture others through that, but obviously through the, the ring of power itself. And he uses that ring, which he forges, in order to take control of the other rings which he's forged, which are also for means of power. So there's a there's a way in which technology is being critiqued in the Lord of the Rings, which is obviously about technology and the dangers of it and the, and the power of it, which is part of its allure and also part of its downfall. And it is dehumanizing. So the, the analogy I made this morning and the observation about it being alienating is that if you think about this, well, even last year I was teaching this course and other courses online through whatever. Zoom. And uh, as you know from that horrid experience, I mean some people like it, but most don't, I don't. Um, we are in different places, but we can be seen on the same screen. And I'll see uh, an image of you, and it can be a virtual image like this one, I'm going to end up throwing this up on YouTube. You can see me, you can, and it's me there, but it's a certain image of me. It's a visual representation of me, and it's a very realistic one because the technology is very powerful now. There's no glitches or lags or anything like that if it's working properly. And it gives the, us the power of meeting virtually when we're actually separated from each other. But one thing I noticed while I was using it is that many people turn their cameras off. Even though I asked them to keep the cameras on because I don't like talking to myself, this picture of myself, even though I know other people on the set, I like to see you. If I'm talking to you, it's hard enough. Yet people kept them off. Well, why is that? I mean, maybe they, I don't. Maybe they're in the pajamas. I don't know. I mean, there can be all sorts of reasons. But one reason that could be the case is people don't like looking at themselves. They don't like how they look. It creates anxiety. Social media is known to be an anxiety um, ask, ac accelerator, if you will. Lots of problems caused on the mental health front by virtue of technology because it presents a certain view of yourself which you can see and you don't like. Because it, in some sense that image of yourself which is, a, which is a, a, a true image in one sense is also one in which you are being reduced to a picture on the screen. And that's, maybe you don't look good that day, you didn't do your hair, I don't have that problem, but that's not, that's not the point. The point is that uh, something about your appearance that you don't like is nonetheless defining you and you're, non, you're unhappy with that. It has a power that it is gaining to utilize you and project you and yet it's also diminishing you in some way. That's a, just a small illustration of the problem but here it can be used and those who own the technology or have power over it have means of, of twisting it to their own ends which again we can see uh, if we can imagine that the government is surveilling you through technology and can go after its political opponents, which we find is the case in countries throughout the world, or at least there's been enough reports about it for me not to have to substantiate it. Uh, but Tolkien's talking about that in the, in the Lord of the Rings through those sort of means of technology, and he describes them as magical. Now we're going to have to talk about that because there's a discrepancy between different types of magic. In, in Tolkien and, and in Lewis for that matter. Uh, Lewis's first novel, uh, not first written, but first in the chronology of the series of Narnia is The Magician's Nephew. But the magician, Uncle Andrew, has rings which do a certain thing. And it's called The Magician's Nephew. We could 
get into that. I got the lecture on YouTube if you're interested. But um, he sees science as a sort of a form of magic. And magic, as we know, is forbidden in scripture. It's connected with idolatry. It's connected with misrepresenting and, and seeking to use power to gain control over the present. It's seeking to exercise God's prerogative in life. And both men are very concerned about that. So that's there even in the fantasy literature of the Lord of the Rings. It's more obvious in science fiction. So that's where I'll begin here. Um, but I'm going to start off with some classical texts. So the introduction will be here. Uh, oh, I didn't even do that on science fiction. Oh, well, I'll pick it up next time. When I deal with uh, this novel by Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. I'm going to talk about Prometheanism. Prometheus was, uh, in Greek mythology, one of the titans. He's one of the earthborn gods who was at war with the sky gods, Zeus and the gods of Mount Olympus. And he was punished uh, for doing a very uh, well documented thing, which is that he stole fire from the gods. That's one of the myths. The other myth, however, is that he was also the creator of mankind. He was a demiurge figure. He created mankind from the clay. So he's a bit like God in the sense that it sounds like Genesis 2, where God breathes into the clay and gives the breath of life and so forth. But there's something that is illicit about his action and something that is transgressive of the moral order of things. Now, Frankenstein in this novel is a scientist. And this is the often accounted, Shelley's Frankenstein is often accounted to be the first work of science fiction, early 19th century. And she's obviously writing a horror novel, you know it as uh, the way it's depicted in movies. Uh, but really, I, I take it as a critique of modern science and what it does in its pursuit of progress to human nature. And the, the way in which it, for in the name of enlightenment, seeks power for those who are the scientists, who are blinded to their own lust for power and seem also blinded to the effect of their experiment on human nature until it's too late, and then the monster's there. So I'm going to take the Lewis's foray into science fiction from that point. Shelley uh, was a famous romantic author, a wife of Percy Shelley as well, and um, I think she was very early in her awareness of the of the problem of the worldview of the Enlightenment and the way it looked at human nature in an abstract way and tried to do things allegedly disinterestedly but actually with a certain power motivation and with bad consequences. So we'll go from that, uh, that first point to uh, science fiction. We'll look at H.G. Wells, The First Man in the Moon. Now this H.G. Wells, mentioned explicitly by Lewis in his first book, by the way, uh, out of the Silent Planet, he mentions H.G. Wells' fiction, and uh, some of the features of this novel are obvious in uh, Lewis's work. Uh, we are being presented with a, a, a universe in which there's no God, and space is being depend, de depicted as space, as something alienating, and there are aliens, in, literally, in the, the first man in the moon. There's a grand lunar in the center of the moon. And uh, the aliens are presented as thoroughly hostile to human life. The, this, this idea does not occur before this period. The idea of science fiction, which we become acquainted with Star Wars and uh, Star Trek and, I mean, all of the science fiction movies that we watch, uh, is a novel thought experiment. My question is why does the thought experiment arise when it arises and what's the purpose of entertaining the idea? And what is the effect of it? Because the imaginative exercise of imagining a scenario that doesn't exist 
is not just done willy-nilly with no purpose whatsoever. It's teasing out an idea that is already latent in the premises of the world in which they live. Uh, I remember reading in a book by Hannah Arendt called The Human Condition, great book, uh, in the second edition that when uh, the uh, Soviets launched a satellite into the orbit or a first manned space flight uh, and li likewise when uh, the Americans landed on the moon some think it's never happened but uh, there was a there was a jubilation exhilaration amongst the populace because we had escaped the world's atmosphere and Arendt's comment is they they talked about the conditions of life as if they were uh, a, a prison from which we need to be liberated. They wanted to escape existence as it had been given so that they could be in an existence where they could fully create it, in which it was fully, it was uh, uh, removed from the conditions of space and time and earthly terrestrial existence. So they saw the earth in a, in a, in a limiting way, not as a, as a condition of life, but rather as a, con as a limitation on their freedom or on their power. So was he, that was her comment. I find it really interesting. In Out of the Silent, uh, or sorry, in The First Man in the Moon, uh, I am going to talk about exactly that. Lu uh, Wells is one of the early authors of, of what is legitimately understood as science fiction because it takes place in other worlds. And uh, Lewis read this. I read it when I was a boy and was quite... Uh, affected by it. Uh, likewise, The Time Machine and uh, The War of the Worlds, made into movies as well now, right? Island of Dr. Moreau, uh, all sorts of H.G. Wells fiction I read uh, as a boy. And it presents a sort of a, a dystopian, a horrific view of life. It, something is deeply wrong. In The Island of Dr. O Moreau, they deal with uh, uh, the cross-pollination of man-beasts create these sort of hybrid creatures, which is being done as we speak in uh, some laboratories, gene splicing and so forth. So the eugenics, the modern eugenics movement is connected with this, by the way. And so all the issues that arise in bioethics are connected with this course as well, and we'll see some of that. Just for example, in Tolkien, uh, in um, the figure of uh, Saruman, with the fighting Urukai, he breeds the orcs with uh, with elves and create and creates a new being that is able to uh, run by uh, light of day what they previously would have not not have done. So it's a genetic experiment. It's a commentary on what was happening in the United States where the eugenics movement began and in Nazi Germany. The backdrop for much of the fiction here, by the way, as well. And these are live issues because the eugenics movement is alive and well. It is happening where we, uh, as we speak uh, here in Canada and around the world. And I think it was a, a crime against humanity then and it remains one. Just by the by. Out of the Silent Planet is a direct response to that. Before we come to that though, I want to read these three, these little short essays uh, which deal with um, getting into Lewis's thought and what he is trying to depict against the science fiction of the day. So one is a notion of human nature, membership. He's talk, talking about in terms of being part of a body uh, and in a sense embodied being, being important to our understanding of human nature. That's what that is all about. And he's going to juxtapose that to the disembodied sense of self that he will present here in The Abolition of Man. The Cartesian idea of, you remember Descartes, uh, the cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. His view of human nature is a disembodied <clears throat> mind, which we will see literally depicted in that hideous strength. There'll be a brain, just in a, like a vat. Uh, and there, that's the aim of the NICE, is to evolve humanity towards a disembodied big brain. 
because the view of human nature that comes with Darwin, think about this, if Darwinian evolution is true, then the question is not only where we came from, but what we're evolving into. And what would, it, what would a better form of human nature be if it isn't what we are already, to, and trying to do that to its utmost? What would it look like to be a superior form of life? Well, the, the bias of, of the ancient world and the bias of the Eastern world would push us towards a disembodied sense of self. It would tend towards nihilism. It would tend towards, um, as I say, a spiritual sense of self, but not a bodily sense of self. So it would push us towards this virtual reality that we operated in for the last two years and make us think that we were making progress in the mix. Anyway, we'll talk about that in Out of the Silent Planet, and it will engage with works that I will reference and videos. I'll have to just direct you to them rather than repeat them. Um, in Out of the Silent Planet, I'll probably mention it briefly here, but I'll expand on it in the videos in which we talk about cosmology and views of, of astronomy. Because Lewis's astronomy in his sci-fi trilogy is the same as the ancient and medieval world and not of the modern world. So he sees the universe as hierarchical and full of life, not the absence of, of anything. What we tend to see everything above planet Earth as outer space, as an absence of anything. And if God is at the top of that, which he is in medieval Renaissance thought, for us, he's at, he is the great vacancy at the top of outer space. In other words, he's nothing. Imaginatively, that has a powerful effect on people. If we think of God as a, as a wonderful idea, the height of human imagination, but not really a true being, but an intellectual concept which we need to hold on to for the purposes of ordering society, the same way Jordan Peterson seems to see uh, Christian belief. It's, it's functionally useful, necessary even, for your life. But let's not pretend that we can know such things or that say that there is actually a God. That would be arrogance on our part. So he says, that's the view, by the way, of modern science. It's the idea that God is unknowable. He can't be known. Whereas the Christian idea of God is that God hides himself from us and also reveals himself to us in his word and in the person of his son, Jesus and he was physically manifest. He led a human life, he died a human death, and then he was raised bodily and ascended bodily to the Father's right hand. This is a very different view of, of God and it's not arrogance, it is the opposite of that. It's, it's humility to accept the revelation that's been given. Say so it all depends on your perspective there. Anyway, the perspective that I've just presented as my own is also that of Lewis and Tolkien in their fiction. It's a, it's a latent Christianity, however. It's, it occasionally becomes overt, in, in more in Lewis's work than Tolkien's. But it's latently there, I would say. I'm going to argue that when we come to Tolkien, that Tolkien is a, needs to be understood as a Catholic um, in the Thomas tradition primarily. But we'll get there when we get there. So we'll go through Lewis's The Sci-Fi Trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, and Paralandra. Uh, we'll look at briefly at the abolition of man, then that hideous strength, and then we will move to part two, which is Tolkien. We'll start with Mythopoeia, which is, is his view of what the artist is doing in writing fiction even. Important, very different than what the Enlightenment slash Romantics think poetry is, which is just self-expression. Um, for uh, Tolkien, it'll be sub-creation. It's, it's using what has been given, the very conditions of creating it all, and, and recasting them. But you can't make something out of nothing. You have to use what's been given, and you can only use the good things that are given. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to that, and then we'll look at his little illustration of this of the artist Leaf by Nagel, which I think you will find delightful if you haven't read it before. It's 
about an artist who creates, he was a, a painter, and he's a very good painter, and he paints a leaf. Can't get to the whole tree, you get a leaf, and he keeps getting interrupted by his neighbor. His neighbor keeps interrupting him, and he's really irritated by this neighbor. I, I'm not going to give it away. Um, but it, it, it says something about the mentality of the artist of which Tolkien was one, and what he viewed of as the importance of his art, which is not very much if you read the story and understand it. I think he sees it being far more important to be a good neighbor than it is to be a great artist. Uh, and then we'll get to the course proper in terms of Tolkien, and we'll look at the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and we'll, we'll get a good bit of time on that. We'll do the Fellowship, the Two Towers, and the Return of the King, nine, cl nine classes in total. And as I say, I will talk about, I'm going to take it on its own, but, the, but the, the sort of direction of the course, what holds it together is this concern about technology and alienation because of a certain worldview, if you will, a certain perspective and the power motif that underlies it, and the way in which it captures people who lust uh, after power. Tolkien sees this as endemic in the human condition, and he's very critical of it, and he presents ways in which uh, that lust for power can be resisted on the part of the least, apparently least, impressive characters in all of Middle-earth, the hobbits, who are resistant to the power of the ring because they're so ridiculous that even they can't take themselves seriously. I think he's commending that to, ourself, to us. It's actually a great antidote to power to be able to laugh at yourself. Don't take yourself so seriously. Stop being bigger than you are, or certainly stop thinking that you are. Uh, but that will... Uh, I'll go through that and then that'll be the end of the course. We'll get to that and wrap it all up. In terms of assessment, two essays, one after uh, reading week. Oh, I've got it as the 13th there, and I have it as the 27th there. Hmm, that's interesting. That's not a small discrepancy either. Well, it's going to be here, the 27th. I'll have to go back and fix that. So it'll be the 27th of February. So after the reading week, first essay. And that one will be obviously on Lewis and science fiction in general, and then the second one will be on Tolkien. Okay? And then there'll be a, an exam at the end. But I like essays as a means of uh, assessment uh, because they allow you uh, the latitude to reflect on things that um, I have left untouched on the course and uh, give you a little bit of possibility to dig down on things that are you want to explore a little bit further. Um, and I found that essays, people learn more by writing things and thinking about things than simply by like doing a, a midterm or something like that. It also helps you become better writers. Added bonus. And by dint of that, I think also better speakers. I think the two are connected. But I wanted to uh, read this. Any comments or questions about that? That's right. Yes? Yes. Uh, at the last possible moment. Um, I'm, I'm almost serious with that, but not, I'm not entirely serious. Um, you've been in my classes before. I don't like to give them early because I don't want my questions to be directing the, uh, the way you're going to read the works. That's it. I have the questions. I've taught the course before. Uh, if you wanted to, you probably hunt them down and find out what they were and whatever. If you want to do that, you know, good on you. But for my part, uh, I mean, you'll probably have a sense of what the questions are going to be anyway from the way I teach the class. But I find that reading the work without any agenda in mind opens you up to reading it without a, a narrowing focus. And I try to be as broad-minded as I can, but in, inevitably I'm going to be restrictive. I'm going to ignore certain things. Better if you see the whole thing to begin with. And that's what when you read that. And again, uh, I teach literature, uh, I think, 
without the agenda of foisting my views on you. I'm trying to get you to appreciate the works themselves and let them speak to you as if Lewis or Tolkien is speaking to you. That's what I'm trying to do. Bring that out and maybe reflect on it a little bit. How does this apply right now? Or how does this, how do we think about this from a Christian point of view? Now the authors happen to be Christian, but I even do that when they're not. I, I do both of that, but, but that's the rationale pedagogically. So I'll give you about three weeks before. By that point, if it's uh, due on the 27th, we'll have got through most of Lewis by that point. And you'll have a good idea. And by that point, I guess we're gonna be in into uh, that hideous strength, so the final um, of the sci-fi trilogy, and you'll have a pretty firm view. By the way, the, the sci-fi trilogy, that hideous strength, this is uh, predicated on the idea that technology is a tower of Babel. That's what the reference to that hideous strength is. It's a reference to the Tower of Babel. And so something Lewis is connecting us to a biblical theme here about the use of uh, humanity uniting together through technology to build towers that make them, and I guess a symbol of pride and arrogance against God. Uh, he sees that in the modern uh, research university and all of the connected organizations that are with it. Remember, he's writing from the vantage point of a university professor. I think he knows what he's talking about. Other questions at, at this point? Sorry, I went on a fair bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this to you. Uh, this is from the year of our Lord, 1943, Christian Humanism in an Age of Crisis, Alan Jacobs, who writes a really good biography of Lewis, if you're interested. It's called, called the Narnian. It's a very good uh, biography, and there's quite a few good biographies of Lewis, but I think it's a very uh, literary one. He has, a, he has an appreciation of the literary uh, gifts of Lewis. But here's what I'm gonna read. In the months following the Casablanca Conference, now what's the Casablanca Conference? It's a conference uh, held by uh, Churchill uh, with uh, Roosevelt, the Free French, uh, and, uh, and others, and they were in, met in Casablanca, remember the famous movie Casablanca, but they met there in 1943 uh, to discuss uh, how to attack the continent of Europe and drive the Germans back. So there's a Casablanca conference going on in early January. At the same time, in the months following the Casablanca conference, Christianity in Crisis, the magazine founded in 1941 by Reinhold Niebuhr and his colleagues at Union Seminary, published a series of articles endorsing and explaining a document called Six Pillars of Peace. The document itself had been produced by an organization called the Federal Council of Churches Commission on a Just and Durable Peace, chaired by John Foster Dulles. And the emphasis is on the creation of an international body that will replace the League of Nations. What it ended up, what ended up replacing the League of Nations is the United Nations. But that was not exactly what was being proposed here. This was from uh, Christians wanting it from a Christian vantage point. If you look at the UN and its charters, it, it does not have the Christian uh, Christianity in the forefront. Rather in the background if they're at all. Um, but it wants autonomy for nations, it wants uh, a repudiation of uh, the Treaty of Versailles, so punishing the enemies, as it were, which they saw had provoked a great war. But this is the more interesting thought. But the thoughts of certain other Christian thinkers followed a different course. On the very day that the Casablanca conference began, Jacques Maritain, gave the first of his four Terry lectures at Yale University, his subject, Education at the Crossroads. The next day, January 15th, W.H. Auden delivered a lecture to the students of Swarthmore College called Vocation and Society. His concern was to explore the power of liberal, liberal education to prepare young people to assume responsible and meaningful callings in a world that needed their skills. 
At the same time, across the Atlantic in the city of Newcastle, C.S. Lewis was preparing to give a set of lectures he would later call The Abolition of Man, or Reflections on Education with Special Reference to the Teaching of English in the Upper Forms of Schools, and at the same time, Simone Weil, a uh, French refugee in London, was writing uh, a, a, an impassioned plea to recover European culture, uh, entitled uh, Enracinement, Rootedness. We need rootedness because we're become, becoming uprooted, alienated. So all of them are seeing the Christians of the day, Maritain, Auden, Lewis, Weil, and when I say Christian, there's it's a loose term, still a recognition that education was a, a primary battlefront. While the war was going on on the continent, something at least as important was happening uh, on the home front. And, and that, I think, is going to be one of the emphasis of the course. In what sense is the war that is fought on the battlefields also being fought in the universities? In, in the education field, in, in the, on the home front, in, in the, literally in the home. And uh, he notes that uh, at the same time T.S. Eliot had just completed his poetic testament, uh, Little Gidding, uh, the last of his four quartets. Great work by Eliot, his best and most important work. Same year, 1943. So right in the middle of the Second World War. And then a few years later, what gets published 1984, uh, and so forth. A horror, not, okay, so we have the secular writers writing in very bleak terms. Uh, we have uh, Aldous Huxley. Uh, we have, uh, as I say, Orwell. Uh, we have the uh, growth of nihilism, Jean-Paul Sartre, and so forth. So a despair from the atheist writers or secular writers of the day at the same time, amongst the Christian writers, a vision of hope for the future. And I want to see that as the backdrop for this course on sci-fi sub-creation as well. The fantasy literature and the sort of science fiction that Lewis and Tolkien are writing is, uh, is an antidote to the bleak view of human life that their secular counterparts are writing about, and which get most of the airtime in universities, quite frankly. You don't, read Tol you don't read Tolkien in the public universities. You don't read Lewis in the, Tol the public universities. How come? It's extraordinary. They're the most popular writers of the 20th century, both men. Uh, Tolkien was voted in Britain as the author of the century twice while I was in Britain. The academics were horrified. How come? I mean, it's just fiction. Don't English professors like me teach fiction? Why wouldn't they teach it? Why, why would they think that the public's uh, sense of great literature, important literature, didn't matter at all, especially when they claim to be on, uh, on the part of the working class, right? Because there's a strong Marxist uh, a, a element to British academia, always has been, at least for decades now. Anyway, I'm gonna delve into all of these things on this course. So you can see I'm going to jump around a fair bit. Um, for those of you who haven't been in the class, I welcome questions. By all means, interrupt me. And I, it, I have no problem with that. I am going to lecture because that's what I do. But I, anytime you have a question and you want to interrupt me, make sure you do so. And, and we'll, because it's usually something that I've touched upon, uh, which I haven't ex sufficiently explained and needs more amplification or it's really important and, and by all means raise it and sometimes I might just say well just put it on hold for a second then we'll get all circled to it but sometimes oh yes I should have mentioned that let's let's dig down on it uh, that's how I like to teach so uh, the more you ask the better as far as I'm concerned I'm, I'm very good with that but I'm gonna keep talking until you stop me and rescue me from that Okay, um, anything else? No, I don't think I have anything else there. But you can see sort of here I've given sort of subtitles to these. These are just broad sub subtitles, but some of the themes that will arise out of this. I see a great deal uh, in the whole enterprise that Lewis and Tolkien do, and it's the reason I became an academic. 
uh, their interest in philology, in languages, I share the interest. I think it's, it's not a small thing. You can get away with mul without languages these days. You can just speak English. Everybody speaks English. I think there's more to be gained from learning languages than just uh, commerce. Something important uh, there in the languages and the roots of the languages. Um, anyway, but we'll get to that when we get to it. But both men are deeply rooted in the humanities tradition. Comments or questions? And if not, I will end the class early for one and only one time. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll be to the bitter end. Yes? So just so the distinction you were saying between what like, uh, Lewis, Auden, and Maritain were doing and what like, Huxley and Orwell were doing was, like Huxley and Orwell were more just kind of exposing where we were headed as society, whereas the others were proposing a Christian solution to the future or to where we were headed. I think that every, the reason that people regard Orwell and Huxley as powerful is because they are describing with prophetic ability that the inevitability of a certain outcome, of a certain pattern of living and acting. And so that, as I say, I read those works when I was in high school. They were on the syllabus, now they're not, and I, can't, I find that baffling, quite frankly, because they seem as relevant, if not more now, than they were when I did. I did 1984 in 1984. That's how old I am. Yeah, before you were born. I, did, I read 1984. And a movie came out that year, 1984. What a year. Um, and they only saw the doom and gloom. And they, they had no vision and they had no hope for the future. Um, because that's all they had. Because they were committed to the secularism, the this worldliness of the world, and the modern project of scientism, they were science. They were effectively uh, committed to scientism themselves. To believe that if we, uh, this that the scientists will lead us to a better future, except they no longer think that. They think the scientists are leading us, but it's not a better future. It's a far worse future. They are going to condition us in ways that we're not going to like. Or in the case of Huxley that we are going to like a lot. Free sex, free drugs. Isn't that great? Well, everyone's going to like it. Everyone's going to be happy all the time. Happy, happy, happy. But is there not a horror uh, that is incumbent upon that? And the answer is yes. And Huxley sees it as well. But he says that's how the future is going to go. They're going to give us carrots. They're not going to give us sticks. They're going to give us carrots. Huxley taught Orwell, by the way. He was his teacher. And Orwell wrote a novel, and Huxley said, no, that's not how it's going to work. They're going to use carrots, and they're going to enslave us. And, and Orwell said, yeah, they're going to enslave us. Literally, they're going to enslave us. They're going to put cameras in every room, and they're going to punish us. And they're going to, they're going to manipulate language. The Ministry of Truth will be the Ministry of Propaganda, etc. And they're going to call propaganda the truth and truth propaganda and so forth. They're going to flip it around. I think both men were right. Uh, what about the combination? Is that not possible? That's what's happened. And so they're both correct. The antidote that all these men are seeing is, yes, we, we are in agreement with how dire this is, but the solution lies outside of the premises that you regard as unquestionable. They are questionable. There is a different way to thinking about it, but it depends on having faith in the living God. And in seeing that nature is not just a thing, but rather it is the handiwork of God. It has a certain intrinsic uh, moral law in it. it. It speaks of the glory of God. This, there is beauty, there is goodness, there is truth. All of these things are signposts that point to a creator. And they bring that out in the novel. So they, rather than just being prophets of doom and gloom, there's the doom and gloom that's the backdrop, and yet there's a council of hope that this will be overcome. And I think that's why people love the novels. Because they want it to be true, even if they can't quite yet believe it. So yes, in answer to your question, that, that's where I think it's coming from. And Maritain is um, writing, he's not a fiction author, but he's, he's, he's a cultural critic, among other things. A Thomas work, lectured here at uh, Toronto, very influential here at the U of T as well. 
Um, and so there is a, a response in this age by Christians that you will never hear about in the academy. You, you might not know it ever even happened. And yet it was there. And there, are, there is a legacy to it. My, my, uh, the lady who taught me medieval literature uh, heard Tolkien in Lewis lecture. And, uh, and she made me want to be a medievalist. I went to Germany to study classical languages and German and so forth. I ended up by, I don't want to get into biographical stuff too much, but by dint of that, she pushed me in that direction. I was not yet a Christian, she was. But I'm here because I believed in something that I had not yet quite understood. Eventually did figure it out, or I was brought to understand, better way of putting it. Um, and so there are little embers left of that great Christian humanist movement. Anyway, that's the title of this book. It's a well-written book as ever uh, by Jacobs. But uh, that's the thrust of the course. And as I say, I think the, the transhumanism in education is a live issue. So is eugenics to this day. Uh, the idea of a technological Tower of Babel is a present reality. And uh, I think that the popularity of fantasy types of works uh, exists to this day, but none of it has the substance of Tolkien's work because Tolkien's work is not just fantasy. There's a lot more, and we'll, we'll get into that. But um, I'm hoping you're going to have fun in the course. The reading list is outrageously heavy. And I apologize for that if you haven't read the works. My assumption is that everyone, when I first taught it, was that everyone had probably read The Lord of the Rings, and then I found out that everyone hadn't. So I apologize for that. But then after I created the syllabus, I thought, but what am I supposed to drop here now? So I've kept it and just decided I'm going to torture you anyway with it. And uh, So it's going to push you, but I think you will find it exhilarating, and I think you will find it uh, enormously enriching of your souls. Other comments, questions? I, I think I've got everything there as far as that goes. But next class we will meet and we'll, I will talk about on science fiction, um, which is uh, I think on the website, but I not, might not have put it up, in which case I shall. I haven't? Of course not. Oh yeah, it's easy. Just do a search. It's there. But I'll, I'll put the link up. Uh, but we're going to talk about this primarily, Frankenstein, with the emphasis on the second part. the ethical breach of the sciences of the order of nature, and particularly the moral law. That's what Mary Shelley, who is a Enlightenment humanist, and by no means a Christian, can see in the sciences, which was repeated uh, in the past year under COVID lockdowns, where the, their own doctrine against eugenics research, namely the Nuremberg Code, was totally set aside. Because the crisis is so extreme, we're going to jettison our one standard of ethics, which is informed consent. Um, so it's contemporary commentary. Okay? I'll be more controversial than this.